I found these wooden boards. There were 5,000 of them. And uh, in a way, I treated the wooden boards the way I did ceramics, that I would just kind of iterate over and over uh, their use, stacking them as architectural forms, thinking about them as conceptual forms. Um, this became a performance space uh, where I invited other amazing artists, including this young man named Dawood Bey, a uh, photographer mainly, but also a, a, a percussionist. A and I, I basically temporarily rented a space in the middle of the fashionable area for grunge artists. Can you guys hear me okay? We're okay? Oh, you want some lights down? All right, turn the lights down. All right. So, um, so I, I created this space because at the time, um, there were no museums interested in what I was doing. Uh, but I really wanted to share this work. So I saved up some money, rented a space temporarily, and made my own exhibition. It seemed reasonable. Um, but the exhibition was part my work, and then part a platform whereby other people's works might be shown, um, performance might happen, dinners might happen. And it was like the beginning of uh, a, a, a first pivot in the way that I imagined my ability to create my own space, convene a group of people who were interested in similar things or maybe even dissimilar, dissimilar things, and then maybe up in, up in the art world so that um, I didn't imagine that the only experiences that I could have were muse museum experiences, but they could be my own autonomous creation. Um, it is reasonable to say that the context of my making uh, also included the fact that the world around me was in uh, considerable disrepair. That there were um, beautiful buildings, unkept, uh, unoccupied, not fully owned by anyone. And my studio was becoming a kind of pristine place for beauty, and I was already asking that question of like, how can the things that I do inside spill outside and maybe have impact somewhere else? And so um, for, for, for the price of something cheaper than, than an exhibition at a museum, I was able to acquire a building, redecorate that building, gut the building. Um, and it was this building that, in, in some ways, uh, started to make space for me in the contemporary art world. There's a gentleman by the name of Francesco Bonomi, an Italian curator at large who was doing projects at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. He came over and I showed him this building. There's so much going on. I showed him this building and um, there was nothing in it. It was just gutted. and. Uh, he liked the building and he said, well, what are you doing? And I, I had one image of a Song Dynasty vase projected on a glass lantern slide projector. And um, you know, I said, I can't afford to do any more, so I've just been sweeping the building and projecting these images. And he invited me to be in the Whitney Biennial. One building became three or four. And, and you know, some of these things I've talked about before, we started to use the buildings as the only real amenity in this neighborhood. Like I was really just trying to say, okay, uh, I don't want to have to go to another neighborhood in order to see a good film. Maybe I could get a film projector, rent a 16 millimeter film, and screen the film for myself first. And if I screen it for myself, I could invite some people, maybe even my neighbors, maybe even my neighbors who are not necessarily interested in art, but might like a good film, or might like a diversion from their day on a Friday night. These are my neighbors, when I say my neighbors, these are not necessarily my friends or my homies. They are just people who live next to me for whom my day-to-day -day reality needs them. 
I need them to look out for when the parking inspector comes and he's about to give me a ticket. I want them to call me and say, hey, Theasta, the parking inspector is coming. Please move your car. When, I, when I, knew, I didn't have an oven, I need an oven. I want to use their oven. And so we started having, you know, hanging out, you know, partying, barbecuing. It was great. We created this space called Black Cinema House where we converted the first floor of my house into a cinema space. We tried to do it really nicely, but nonetheless, it couldn't fit more than 40 people. It was just, you know, the first floor of an apartment. I lived upstairs. This became really tenuous uh, because Black Cinema House started to take on a life of its own, so people had access to my house. They would come over early in the morning. Mr. Gates! We want to pre-screen the film that we're showing tonight. Um, so I moved Black Cinema House. As this work started to grow, let's say we're at like 2011, 2012, the University of Chicago finds out that I'm doing this work on Dorchester. Uh, and then the university asks, hey, can you do the work that you're doing in the hood over here for us? This building, uh, that's so cool. This building here, uh, the university owned it, and they owned it for maybe seven or eight years. It's in the middle of an all-black neighborhood. If you go east, uh, across Washington Park, this is where the University of Chicago is. And on the west side of the park is a largely black neighborhood. The university thought that in the future, it might grow and expand and it would need these buildings eventually, but they wouldn't need them for about 50 years, they imagined. Well, what do you do with these buildings in the 50 years before the university needs them? And so um, the local politicians really wanted something that would benefit the community. The university, of course, would want something that benefits the university. What's the compromise? The arts. The <laughs> arts. The arts. Culture. The arts. The arts, you know, it's non-judgmental, it's non-political. If there's a problem, you can blame the artist and not have to blame the institution. That um, even when you lose or you fail, you win. This is great. And so I said to the university, why not the arts? <laughs> and they said, OK. Now, uh, maybe a, a first or second kind of theoretical proposition. We know sometimes that, that governments value the arts even when they don't value art or artists. That developers and uh, construction moguls and uh, money people, uh, corporate headquarters, value the arts. But uh, even when there's no place for an artist to live, or for an arts organization to have affordable space for their small entity, but they want the activity, they don't want necessarily the people. In a way, uh, artists are like unwanted people. Useful until, uh, uh, they want to, in, until they want to be at the party on the same terms as everyone else. I've experienced this. Anyway, we built this space for the arts. And, um, and we were able to say to people who live in Washington Park that the residencies and the exhibitions that happen here, the food that'll be served, it's all for you. And this was a, this was a real uh, breakthrough for the university, that a thing could be for a community that is not the university community first, and that as a byproduct of building it, the university will also benefit but that there could be a consideration of others in advance of the university and that that might be uh, something that actually works well within the rubric of education. But always with these, uh, the crime lab, the social lab, the urban lab, all of these things are imagining our communities first as places for testing, for occupation and research, but never for, rent, for friendship or for love or for partnership or co-advancement, it's always like uh, you become a number in a survey. And I think that Washington Park and black people who live 
around the university feel this all the time, whether it's talked about or not, and that maybe we find really romantic words uh, to hide this fact. Anyway, I found myself deeply now advancing in my art career and then advancing as this kind of trickster, moving between arts administration and the creation of the arts, political, and then being an artist, maybe even attempting to be subversive, so much so I don't know when I'm being one or the other, that I was fully an administrator. I was fully a politician and fully an artist, and I was not always sure of myself. The development bug hit me, and I started thinking that maybe there was a way that this brain, it's a fairly small brain, that the brain that I had for space could be useful not only for my own personal pleasure. I was making mini hammams and uh, bathhouses, film screening spaces, but maybe there was something that I could do that was like a little bit more ambitious. And this was a 36 unit low income housing project that had been abandoned because lots of violence happened there, because people from varying different locations were brought to this place. They didn't like each other. They were from different territories, and they would shoot each other, kill each other, sometimes killing others in the crossfire. It was shut down, and then I asked the Chicago Housing Authority if we might turn this into a kind of mixed income uh, artist community. So we did that. I did it with the help of a local developer, and the this space that we carved out, this art space, I decided that I would, you know, pardon the word curate, please, not a curator, but that I would be really intentional about the programmers and the programs that happen so that uh, developers all the time in these low-income projects have uh, a community space, but there's usually no one to really sophisticatedly run it. So then it has like some cupboards, maybe a stove, a refrigerator, and uh, a mop, you know, and some folding chairs. And that's the community space. But what happens if you get the baddest black yogi in Chicago, right? And, and, and say, look, we will, we will pay you and subsidize your fee, but you bring the people and you teach them how to be in their bodies. And so uh, very quickly we had this uh, 75 person, loving, you know, black in their bodies. You know, this, this, these sisters were in here, and uh, you know, everyone's doing downward dog, and they're doing their standing trees, and uh, they're crouching tigers. And then it made, you know, then we started getting brothers to come, you know, because they were interested in the activity <laughs> happening there. I know that this is not art, what I'm talking about right now, perhaps. Oh, I keep wanting to point instead of scroll. But there were other buildings that I couldn't uh, salvage, that even in my uh, God complex, I couldn't save them all. And so as St. Lawrence was being torn down, I was trying to figure out what else could be done. We started talking to the demolition company and asked if we would be able to, um, as they were demolishing the building, could we create a work program on top of that where we would clean up the bricks, palletize the bricks, and then make them available to do other things, like maybe new sacred spaces around, around. Re or these men and women could resell the bricks and, and make some cash. We ended up getting the brick and the limestone, the marble, the, the slate, the steel, the wood. That inspired me to then start making brick art. That I, I became really curious about like, what could I do? And I started making handmade bricks and kind of having a conceptual response to this real thing that was happening out in the world that I needed to respond to myself because there was no way that I could bring St. Lawrence Church into the gallery, but I wanted to talk about these things. And there I was starting to make a kind of echo between um, 
the things that were happening outside the studio and things that I wanted people to know in the, in the, in the art world, in the world, maybe, you know, in the, in the world of art. And so the more that I uh, made these handmade bricks under the auspices of a thing that I called Soul Manufacturing Corporation, I was, I was prophesying the possibility of a company on the South Side run and owned by black people that would have the ability to manufacture a thing from nothing to something, and that the world would want this. So these, these bricks were heavy and um, imperfect, but cute, you know, conceptual. And that these uh, palletized bricks would help me pay for the kiln, which would allow me to make more bricks travel to real brick manufacturing companies, get to know people that would then be invested in the idea of potentially being a brick partner with me and my crew. Scroll. We have a lot of wood. There's a lot of teenagers. And, and it just got to the point where it was more fun to just look at a problem, think about the problem in relationship to the people who were adjacent, and then try to make something maybe more poetic happen. And so at this point, it was like, it could be anything. You know, it could be anything. It could be, it could be the creation of wood sculpture for other people, and we become fabricators. Um, it could be projects for me. Or in some cases, it was, it, we would go out and say, you know, uh, of the storefronts that are on Garfield Boulevard that don't have signage or maybe need menus in their restaurants, could we just, just have some service projects where we use the wood that we have to, to, to do this. And so we have our high schoolers would then go uh, fishing for new ideas, new problems to solve. It's really cool. I don't actually know what the next slide is. So, uh, you, you know, I'm, ju I'm just kind of having fun riffing this. <laughs> the city called me one day and said that they had a problem of these 90,000 trees that had to be torn down. And I've been, I've been talking about this quite a bit. Um, but I think that this project is one that I'm really proud of because the city wanted me only to take two or three trees and make some art out of them, but they still had like 90,000 trees. And so, uh, you know, I told them what you need is, uh, you don't need an artwork, you need a mill, you know? And so, you know, with these same brothers and sisters, we decided to um, find some millers, introduce them to these young people, uh, bring a temporary mill outside. Uh, the city dumped 3,000 trees, and they were like, all right, well, if you think you can do this, go for it. And they dumped some trees. And over the next year and a half, we ended up creating a kind of mill milling situation where now we can mill about 100 trees a day. We probably do 25 because why hurt yourself? have some fun and take a long lunch. But um, it is really exciting now to see some of these uh, old, I, I hate to racialize everything, but I'm sorry. In my country, things are racialized, so please forgive me. It's amazing to see these old, white, unioned carpenters who are maybe retired working with these young, uh, black, uh, students who have maybe never thought about the idea of design or urban planning or architecture or finished carpentry as career paths or something like this. And to have them in kind of deep dialogue and what we're finding is that um, you can't be what you can't see. You can't be what you can't see. So it's like, you know, a brother's out there milling or a sister's out there milling and she's like, I really like this. I, I, I never knew how a two by four became a two by four. How a three by 16, I've never seen a piece of wood so wide. You know, because some of the trees, you can see some of these trees. Some of them are, they're like huge, you know? And so it's like you run it through this, this, this saw, or you run the saw through the tree, it's like butter. It's like, you know? And then you, you cut these slices and it's like the board is this wide. And you're like, well, how did, like, you know, and so then we get to talk about um, raw materials and economy. We talk about like how these um, 
the sawdust becomes a byproduct. The bark becomes a byproduct. All these things, then we're making uh, our own pallets and our own A-frames, and we're making a pellets that become fuel for our wood fire kiln, and all of a sudden I'm back at ceramics, which is great. Um, we're growing things, and people eat it, along with like Jay's barbecue chips and uh, Powerade. Um, the project that Ms. Aditi wants, so I had a different PowerPoint, but uh, Aditi is very convincing in terms of the things that I should talk about. So I'm going to talk about what she wants me to talk about. Um, okay, I'm going to go forward. This building, I now call it the Stony, Arts, Stony Island Arts Bank. It was called the Stony Island State Savings Bank, then the Southmore, then Guarantee Bank. <clears throat> and in that bank was um, uh, the partitions between bathroom stalls were made of this kind of marble-like material, almost marble. And um, the city of Chicago was going to get rid of, they were going to tear the building down. I asked if they would give me the building. Um, they said that they would give it to me on the condition that I would do what became about $550,000 worth of repairs before they would give me the deed. It was said that the building was given to me for a dollar, but nothing is ever given to, to a person for a dollar. If anyone tries to sell you something that seems like it has more value than a dollar for a dollar, don't take it. <laughs> but I thought that this building was the last of a particular kind of building in my neighborhood. This is 68th and Stony Island, uh, 12 blocks further south of the University of Chicago. It may as well be a plane ride away or a universe away that um, people are often told when they join the faculty or staff or even young students, don't go past 63rd Street. And I'm five blocks past 63rd, which means I'm in the lower levels of hell. Nonetheless, the building was a beautiful one and kind of worth saving, I thought. Um, it was not in such good shape. But it was at this point when the, when the glass, when the windows were put back in the building and they were no longer boarded up, and we had done a first uh, cleaning of the building, people started to drive past and slow down. They would drive past and slow down. And then over time, people would slow down. And if I was outside, they'd say, hey, my dad used to bank at that building. These would be like old Jewish men and women. You know, my dad used to bank. And then I'd see a, a brother, a black man, would go by with a funny hat on. He would say, hey, when I was young, the, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the, the Nation of Islam used to own this bank, and they used to bank here. And all of a sudden, just from cleaning up the building, there were all these stories waiting to happen. Like, in a way, the preservation was a trigger for this other spiritual activity. And that if someone would just, like, just make the first strike, that then all these other things might happen. That it was a, a tiny demonstration of care. It felt like the building was a painting. Like cars would slow down the way you'd want to slow down at a painting and just kind of observe, just kind of be present with it and maybe be greater because you're standing in front of the painting. I like this. But this is what the building looked like on the inside. And so I would bring people in, and I'd be like, oh my god, I'm so excited. You know, this is going to be the library, and down here, we're going to have our music thing. And over here, the vault, we're going to like, I don't know, have raves. And it's going to be awesome. And um, it was hard for people to see. And I, I realized that maybe this is where, maybe I am really an artist, or just really crazy, you know, where I, I had to, to, to both speak it into existence and maybe see it, you know. But because it was difficult for other people to see, uh, it was hard for them to want to also offer their support. Um, it, it was just a difficult, it was a difficult time trying to con convince people that the thing that I saw in my mind 
might be realized, you know. And that in a way, this was not a blank canvas. It was like negative blank. It was blank negative. You know, that, that first to get it, you know, y'all know what I'm saying. But at the same time that I had acquired the building for a dollar, um, I was starting to uh, collect these other things. Now, I should say, all these things were made possible because I have an appetite for um, junk and other people's problems. I have an appetite for other people's problems. I love material culture, but I mean, I could find more tidy culture. But I think, you know, today we went to, uh, how do you pronounce it? Sanskriti. We went to Sanskriti. Yeah? Man, I'm going to, I mean, this is bad. Like, I have bad English already, so forgive me. We went to Sanskriti, and there's a, there's a space called the Museum for Everyday Things, Objects. Museum of Everyday Art. Nice. Right? And I think that I was maybe in dialogue with this, but I didn't have a name for it. That I wanted to convince other people that the everyday things of their lives had value. And the way that I was going to do this was I was going to take those everyday things and put them in such a nice case. You know, I would just clean them up and just like put them there and then change the light. You know, just shine the light. And that that thing that we uh, didn't pay a whole lot of attention to, like the shoes we used to wear, or the glasses our grandfathers and grandmothers had, or the skillets and the pots and pans and the knives, um, or the little colonial objects that we made to make fun of the white people when they came, that all of those things would have a value. And that, that I would collect them wherever they were, and then the bank would be the repository where people might deposit their cultural goods, let's say. While this was happening, uh, things started to be donated to me. So, so this beautiful woman, Linda Johnson Rice, told me that uh, she had some books. She knew that I liked books, and she had some books, and she gave me a lot of books. And we ended up creating this uh, library, which is essentially 26,000 books about the black experience, 1850 to 2000, thereabouts. And it's become kind of the heart of the, of the building. In a way, nothing else needs to happen in the building except this library exists and it becomes a kind of uh, uh, declaration. It's its own manifesto that black things matter. And that if we, and these are books, they're just everyday books. Some uh, Zora Neale Hurston, some Toni Morrison, some James Baldwin, you know what I mean? Just everyday thing, things that other people have in their library, even if they don't read a lot. And that maybe if they see that same book in my library, and they look at the dignity and the aesthetics of this library, that they would go home and imagine their books differently. That they might even read as a result of the library being sexy. Or maybe they just want to be in the library more because the library is sexy. And they might even invite someone else to be in the library. They might even change their behavior because the library feels good and makes them want to be a better person. This is maybe now when art meets something like the divine for me, that, that one would be changed as a result of the encounter. So we started having shows, important artists, doing great things. And I was trying to figure out, you know, I spent some time studying in other places and, 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 and I was really deeply trying to consider um, what could I contribute to the conversation of preservation or maybe conservation. And in the US, uh, if there is an old house, and uh, very old, like uh, 80 years would be old in the US, the house is old, the roof caves in. And then the house no longer looks old. It becomes a new house. They change all the clappers. They change the door. And they say, this is the same period door. But the thing is new. But it, you can't, there's no trace. There's no trace of anything old, and they painted it lily white. 
So it's a new lily white building, which sounds like America to me. Kind of a new lily white building. America is a new lily white building. And so I was really committed to allowing some of the decay. It's okay. It's okay. You just roll with me. Allowing some of the decay of this building to be evident. But when people would come in, they would say, like, they, they could say two things. Either that looks like a stain. Like, why didn't you paint it? Or uh, that's really beautiful. Uh, and they were trying to imagine, like, what's the difference between uh, beauty and the stain? And, and, and is it possible that sometimes the stain is adding value? Uh, maybe, maybe some might say you become even more aware of the beauty through the stain because of the whiteness of the plaster adjacent to it that it's actually the finish of the plaster next to the stain that makes this thing even more beautiful. If, if it's just the stain, just deterioration, uninteresting. Just the lily white house, uninteresting. But when those things come together, maybe something new happens. I'm, I'm proposing. Not theoretical. Wherever the building failed, we needed new drywall. It became white. Wherever the building was surviving, we stabilized the things that were there. So we found ourselves with a home, and then we found ourselves with things. Well, a white home for black things. And I'll stop right there. I'll just stop. I'll stop. I'll stop, ladies. I'm sorry. But I'm going to just talk about some of these black things. So Linda, in addition to giving me her books, there were all these other periodicals that were there. Um, Johnson Publishing produced uh, Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, a magazine called Hue, Negro Digest, which was a version of the black version of Reader's Digest. Ebony was the black version of Life Magazine. And one might ma ask, why do you need a black version of a thing? Why would one make a new, if there's already the thing, why do you need a black version of the thing? And this is where John Johnson was genius. The truth is, Life magazine was not the American experience. It was only the white American experience. It's a truth. And that the things, like say, if I were an aspiring middle class dentist in 1943, the only aspiration I would have through Life magazine would be a white aspiration. In fact, I never saw myself, so I, might ne I may not know that there are other dentists who look like me in other parts of the country. John Johnson was attempting to unify these parts, to let people know that they weren't alone uh, in their loneliness, in their um, stewardship, in their academic pursuit, uh, in their intelligence, in their mobility. Um, and so Johnson mimicked, he appropriated the Life magazine structure for black people. And he was like, why not stop? Why stop at Black America? Let's do it in Zimbabwe. Let's do it in South Africa. Let's do it for the Caribbean. You know, and, and, and he was trying to have more and more specific stories that would help people understand that they were part of a diasporic um, aspiration. Ebony Magazine was about aspiration. Anyway, I had these things, and I'm not a librarian, so I decided to try to. I don't know, make some art out of it, you know, put, mix them up, change the colors, you know, put them in things, hang them, you know, do things. And uh, it, it didn't work so well. That those things really wanted to be a library and they really needed a, a, like an, archive, an archival care. And so, and so we, we got more and more serious about it. And I found myself kind of falling in love with houses for books. And I, I just kind of keep making them over and over. The books were going well, and then we started getting records. Um, this is a collection of albums from uh, the Frankie Knuckles uh, Foundation. Frankie Knuckles was an important house music DJ. Um, died two and a half years ago and uh, needed, uh, his, needed to create an estate. His friends who were caring for his things needed to create an estate and didn't know how. And, uh, and so we worked out a way of 
making an estate for his things. And, uh, and the albums are licensed to us for the next 10 years. So when you come to the Arts Bank, we try to play house music all the time. Do you guys know what house music is? Some, who doesn't know what house music is? No offense. Yeah. So house music is like uh, club music. And in Chicago, it was music that was really the origins of which were in the 70s disco movement. So um, I have some favorite songs, you know, burn, baby, burn. Disco Inferno, burn, baby. Car wash, working at the, working at the car wash, yeah. One, real funky, real funky. And then, and that, and that, that music, uh, disco music would then be combined with uh, what became a kind of more like, you know, just beat, just, just beats, just rhythm, jungle house, Detroit techno, and so and so. So we party and we read, like you guys. <laughs> That's what I hear about uh, the Delhi Center, that you, you party as hard as you read. OK, here's a good example, just, just this, this here. That um, when you're working out uh, the cost of the renovation with your construction crew, and they're telling you, they asked if we can gut the whole building for $75,000. But if you want to do this selective remediation, it's going to be $150,000 to $250,000. Just, it's just harder to do. It would be easier to just go in and, and take it all away. Um, but these moments became opportunities where I could teach a team of people how to plaster. And that we could, we could commit to a kind of plastering that would have been uh, the plastering that was done in 1923. A little more lime, maybe there's a little bit of hay in the, in the, in the plaster, making a stronger, more fibrous body that would help, you, help it last uh, through rains and the bad conditions that this building went under. And, and so I thought, no, let's do the selective remediation. And then instead of your plaster contract, my guys will do the plaster. And I was creating a, a problem within a solution, which means more time and more money. But, but the problem was one that was manageable. And we could say, hey, we need a team of men and women who are interested in plastering. We have three months to train you before we get to the point where we need to plaster. Then we have eight weeks to get the plastering done. If it goes beyond eight weeks, then I got to let my general contractors do it because we'll be behind time. But, but looking for problems that um, people in my neighborhood could solve. The bank has never been broken into. There's never been any defacement. There's no, bad things happen around us all the time. But the people who protect the building now were the people who laid the plaster during the bank's development. And even if they, for reasons of the building's architecture, which feels colonial in a particular way, or at least uh, exclusive. Even if they don't immediately feel like the bank is theirs, there's something about having worked in the bank that makes them feel like they're a part of it. Even though they go in and the art looks weird, it's like, well, I did the walls on the third floor. I buffed the floors, right? And, 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 and not to be pejorative, but to say, that in a place where class dynamics are complicated, even if everybody in the neighborhood is black, those become the moments that call us back to a place that says, you built it, therefore you're welcome. Or you're, built it, you're building it and you're welcome. Some brothers. It's good to have some brothers in the pictures. They were building the library. This is Gaylord and Brother Mike. Some glass slides from the University of Chicago that eventually became one of the cherished things. Gaylord's very handsome. He's an urban planner. He'll be on my next trip. That's Devin. He's smart. <laughs> but all of this construction is really just trying to get to um, the care of these objects. There's a kind of co-working between the objects and these little things. Beautiful images of people. 
and space where people can get down, do their little dance classes, build things. Didi mentioned that um, the Obama Center is near me and, and I'm working with them. These things that are in pink are, are buildings that we've worked on over the last six, seven years. And um, it represents about, about a mile, mile, and, mile, mile and a half. And you know we're really proud. Where it says University of Chicago here, Stony Island Arts Bank, University of Chicago, the library is going to go somewhere in between, right there. The Obama Center, that's what they call it. They don't call it a library. That's important because the same people who told me that the bank wasn't worth investing in, they called it an albatross. I didn't even know what albatross meant. You know, they were like, this is an albatross. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> you know, you're an albatross. Your mama an albatross. Um, they now call me a real estate mogul. You know, they're like, oh my God, Theaster, your timing was brilliant. You know, I mean, how did you know that, that the, the, the wind would sway the Obama Center toward uh, uh, Jackson Park? And I mean, this is where it gets spiritual again, that when you, when you commit to the thing that you're supposed to do, sometimes it works out. That's nice. Now, I'm just bragging. This is just like, I'm just bragging. This is my last slide. And uh, all of these buildings were abandoned, you know. All of them were um, valued less than they should be because they were in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time. And, and that with some concerted effort, um, people now want to live there again. Thanks very much.